Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, so let's wait for a few more minutes. Uh, we're, you know, it's 6 p.m. in Kathmandu, and we are about to start the program, but let's wait for a couple of minutes before starting. Thank you. So maybe uh, we should start. So thank you all for joining uh, today's evening. Uh, this event is organized, you know, in the occasion of Sandy's uh, 42nd Research and Training Workshop. Um, so I would like to uh, request uh, Ishimo Deputy Director General, uh, Ms. Isabel Kozil for her welcome remarks. Uh, Isabella, over to you. Dr. Pima, how are you? Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Isabella Kojel, and I'm the Deputy Director General of, of ISIMOD. And on behalf of ISIMOD, I would like to welcome all of you to the start of the 42nd biannual research and training workshop. And of course, the keynote address by Professor Jeff Vincent. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with ISIMOD, um, we are headquartered in Kathmandu, Nepal, and we are a regional organization and a knowledge center working on transboundary problems across the eight countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, India, China, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. Sandy is one of our initiatives. And as you may already know, Sandy is a research capacity and academic leadership development network that works in 10 countries of South Asia, including the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. The network aims to build a better understanding of the interlinkages between environment and development, and in particular in generating locally grounded evidence 
for informing development policies. This is the the 42nd research, which only serves to demonstrate our long history and the long history of Sandy in serving the region. Um, today's keynote topic, restoring global forests, opportunities and challenges is very relevant to our region, given that this will be one of the hardest hit regions from climate change. And this will manifest in terms of increasing risks of extreme events, biodiversity loss, and their implications on humanity. humanity. Forest restoration has been identified as one of the low cost strategies for climate change mitigation, notwithstanding the important role it can play in ecosystem regeneration. Global commitment in this area is growing. The UN decade on ecosystem restoration encourages countries to do large scale forest restoration. And more recently, the Glasgow Declaration of the World Leaders on Forest and Land Use at COP26 reaffirmed their commitment to sustainable land use and forests as key tools for combating global warming and resulting climate change. In our region, in the Hindu Kush Himalaya, countries have been investing in forest restoration through plantations, as well as natural regenerations for quite a long time. And they're the, 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 the successful community forestry programs in Nepal and Bhutan, and the more recent 10 billion trees tsunami response in Pakistan. However, we still need more evidence on how forest restoration can better support biodiversity conservation and ecosystem services, as well as livelihood improvement. In this regard, Sandy has been conducting research in five countries on this very issue, and there is a plan for extending it in coming years. Given this, today's talk by Jeff will be highly relevant for us, and we very much look forward to listening to him. I wish you a very successful and productive workshop over the coming days. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Isabella, for your uh, welcome remarks. So now I would like to uh, invite Professor Sheetal Sekri for moderating the session. Uh, Professor Sekri is, uh, you know, from University of Virginia. She is a professor of economics at the university, and she is also uh, one of the Sandy advisors. So I'd like to uh, hand over the screen to Sheetal. Uh, Sheetal, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Maniji. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Vincent, who's the Clarence F. Kossian Professor of Forest Economics and Management in the Nicholas School of Environment at Duke University in the United States. In his illustrious career spanning over 30 years, Dr. Vincent has made outstanding contributions to the economics of forest management with a special focus on forest restoration in developing countries. And he has also spearheaded several um, initiatives uh, on research and capacity building in Asia. So he's going to talk to us today about restoring global forests opportunities and challenges. And so before I hand over the floor to him, just a few rules of engagement. Um, I'll be moderating the session. So if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box. Um, we will listen to the talk first and we'll get to the discussion after the talk and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible within our time constraints. Um, and so I think um, those are the three rules um, uh, for, for just uh, making today's uh, discussion a, a, a very um, stimulating and, and educating for us. Um, with that, I'd like to hand over the screen back to Jeff. Jeff, take it away. Thank you, Sheetal, for the kind words and good morning and good evening to all of you. I appreciate your interest in my talk and I look forward to your feedback on it. I do wish we could be together in person, but I'm grateful that we have the technology so we can at least meet virtually. I'm going to share my screen now. And let me 
confirm that you're able to see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, well, you've heard the title already, Restoring Global Forest Opportunities and Challenges. I'm going to cover three broad topics. Uh, the first is why there's a need for more economic research on forest restoration. Uh, the second is a, a quite a broad issue, which has to do with the financing of large scale restoration. And then I wanna wrap up by giving you a sampler of some recent research on this topic. I'm gonna to draw quite a bit of this information from an article that was published uh, within the last month or two in the annual review of environment and resources. It's a review article by myself, Sarah Curran, who's a demographer at University of Washington, and Mark Ashton, who's an ecologist and silviculturist at uh, Yale University. And um, uh, this article uh, covers various aspects of forest restoration in low and middle income countries. Um, because of the limits of time, I won't be able to cover everything in this article, in particular portions that pertain to demography and uh, silviculture, but it's all there um, and it's open access uh, if you want to read more. To start, um, when I say forest restoration, what do I mean? Well, I'm referring to uh, establishing tree dominated ecosystems that supply forest goods and services. The kinds of goods and services that we ordinarily think of as coming from forests. Those can include fuel, wood, timber, carbon sequestration, biodiversity habitat, and a range of other forest related ecosystem services. And because we're talking about restoration, we're Thank talking you. about this is this is Subrando. We are only seeing your first slide. It has not advanced. It's not advancing. It's not. Uh, we're just seeing the title slide. And it's not in the slideshow mode. Also in my screen. Yeah, it's so. not in the slideshow mode. It's in the in the slide making mode. Okay, so I'm in slideshow mode. Okay, folks, uh, give us a second while we figure this out. Okay. Can you try uh, unsharing and sharing it again? Yeah, let's try that. Also, uh, I'll take a moment here and let, let uh, uh, mention that please, if you have questions about the talk, please put them in the Q&A chat box. Um, that's where um, we'll be mo you know, monitoring the questions there. Thank you. So we can see your screen now. Oh, it's gone. It's gone again. Yeah, I, I, um... Okay, let's give this another go. Okay, so you see my slide, and on the left, you see the, the, um, thumbnails of the set of yes. slides, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Ah, this is very strange. Okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna close PowerPoint and stop sharing and just start over completely, okay? Yeah. And if this doesn't work, then maybe if you have PDF version, that might work better. Give this another go. Or you can simply uh, share it without full screen. Yeah, uh, if need be, we'll do that. Okay, so you see my, my title slide again in the thumbnails on the left, yes? Correct. Yes. Yeah, it's the same, yeah. If you, okay. can you click on the annual reviews, the third slide, let's see if it at least moves for us, when you move. So once you click the full screen, uh, it it gets frozen. Okay, so you're not seeing outline or annual reviews. No, no, no. Rats. Maybe Very you strange. can you can uh, share without full screen. 
because that was working. Another outside option, Jeff, is to send your slides to money. Too big? Yeah. Yeah, too big. Um, well, let's go with this. So a consequence is going to be that um, some of the text is going to be small uh, because I didn't uh, plan these slides to be presented at about, uh, what, two thirds of their size. But um, listen to what I'm saying and uh, hopefully everything will make sense. Okay. So let's, let's uh, make another go at this. Uh, you've seen the title slide. I've given you the outline. And let me just check, is, is the, the text on this slide legible? Now your screen is not visible. Now you're just looking at your face. Yeah, not shared, yeah. Okay. I, I think Ray's, uh, if you, I think there is some kind of mode where we can only view the speaker and the, the slides. If you can maybe change that to. Unfortunately, is is not shared his screen yet. <laughs> yeah, let me reshare. Okay, let's. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, so if you can remove spotlight, that might help raise. Okay. Mm, okay. Done. Moving now. Are the it's slides now. moving? Yeah, it's now. moving yeah. now. Okay. Now let's try one more thing. Let's 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 see if we're lucky. Um, let me try uh, slideshow mode and see if that also moves, or if the slides move. Okay, there's the title slide. You see the second slide? It's no. it's frozen again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just go with with this. Yeah. Still moving. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You see outline? Yes. Yes. Great. And can you read what's on this slide? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. I think we're going to be able to make this work. Uh, thank you folks for your patience and um, let's go get on with the show. So I gave you the outline. I mentioned this article. Okay. In the annual review. And I was giving you my definition of forest restoration um, that I'm referring to locations where forests naturally occur. And by restoration, I mean the reestablishment of tree dominated ecosystems that supply goods and services of the type we think of as coming from forests. And um, a couple implications of this definition, um, I am including planted forests and introduced species. So I'm not thinking of restoration in the way that many conservation biologists think of it, which is to limit it to forests of native species that may naturally regenerate. I'm also leaving out perennial tree crops, oil palm orchards and, and the like, okay? Um, my focus is gonna be primarily on low and middle income countries in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, Latin America, and the Caribbean. By low and middle income, I mean countries that were in that World Bank classification for most years between 2000 uh, to the present. And you see a, a map of those countries here. That's the countries that are in green. Over the last decade or so, there's been a series of initiatives announced to promote global forest restoration. The Bond Challenge in 2011, followed by the New York Declaration of Forests in 2014. And then in June of this year, the launch of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Why the global interest uh, primary driver is climate mitigation. And here's a, a figure from a paper by Bronson Griskin and others in PNAS 2017, which shows the um, amounts of carbon that can be sequestered through different nature-based climate solutions and also provide some information on the cost. Now, um, by the way, since we're going to, we've switched from presentation mode to my slides, there's gonna be some simple animation that is gonna be missed. So you're gonna see some things piled on slides that would not have been there originally. So just bear with me, I'll, I'll get us through this. Um, and I put in red, the red box here, options related to forests. And the first one is reforestation. We see the greatest estimated amount of climate mitigation potential uh, from restoration compared to other options related to forests and compared to options outside the forest sector. This figure also provides some information on costs. And I, I want you to remember these numbers. Um, the lighter gray 
represents options um, where it's possible to um, sequester carbon at a price of no more than 100 US dollars uh, per ton of CO2 equivalent. The darker gray would indicate options where um, the uh, uh, mitigation is possible at a much lower price of, of $10 uh, per ton of CO2 equivalents, okay? So 110, think of these as estimates in the literature of uh, carbon prices associated with mitigation under um, uh, forest-related options. This is a, a figure from the IPCC uh, report of uh, three years ago, global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade, which again provides information on uh, different nature-based options. Here it's options to remove CO2 from the air, not um, uh, so much to prevent the release of CO2 in existing stocks. And this estimates that afforestation and reforestation are among the lowest cost options and also with substantial potential. Now, if you're wondering about these terms, afforestation, reforestation, essentially um, these terms are differentiated according to the characteristics of the sites where forests are being regenerated. If the most recent land use was um, uh, uh, not a forest, typically that would be uh, using the land for agriculture, crops or pasture, then we're referring to afforestation. If the most recent land use was forestry of some sort, that is there were trees on the site, but they were lost due to harvest or wildfire or some other uh, cause of damage, then that's, that's reforestation. I'm not going to make a big uh, point about the difference between these terms as we go on, but I thought you might wonder uh, how they are distinguished. There is um, certainly great biophysical restoration potential. Uh, this is a map from a study by Jean-Francois Bastin and others published in Science two years ago. Uh, the top panel here shows where trees can grow. That's uh, approaching 9 billion hectares of the Earth's surface. The bottom panel, which in here is where there's a little bit of animation, I'm gonna manually uh, remove the screen. This shows where no trees currently exist outside of urban areas and cropland. And that's about 2 billion hectares. So what they've done is to take the total area where trees can grow, subtract off areas where trees are already present, which is around 4 billion hectares, uh, take out urban areas and cropland, and they're left with about around about 2 billion hectares of land that they estimate is available uh, to restore forests. That's equivalent to about half of current forest land. So this is a big number, okay? And as we'll, we'll see, there are certainly opportunities on cropland. And if we add those in, then that bumps up this figure even more. Now, where are the economists in this work? Uh, earlier this week, I did a search on Web of Science um, using the phrase forest restoration. I got about 3,000 hits, 3,000 publications related to forest restoration. I then went to EconLit and I got about 118. Uh, hits. Okay, so um, out of the rather large amount of work on forest restoration, very little of it is uh, being done by economists. Um, now, if we change the terms, we put in afforestation or reforestation, we bump up the figure for economists by a few hundred, but it remains relatively low compared to the large body of work on forest restoration. If we were to search for a different term, say deforestation in econlet, we get a bunch of publications. So it's not that economists are not interested in forests, it's that being dismal scientists, um, we're interested in the more depressing topic, which is the loss of forests. And we've not worked as much on the more optimistic topic, which is the potential for restoring forests. So relatively little work uh, by economists on this topic. Now, why should economists, and I'd say especially economists in the global south, be interested in forest restoration? I'm gonna go through several reasons. Um, the first is that there's evidence that there is a forest transition underway in many low and middle income countries. Now, what do I mean by forest transition? Um, this is the idea that with economic development, uh, cities grow, um, off farm job opportunities become available, people migrate out of rural areas. And as they do that, uh, the costs of agriculture increase and with the increased costs, uh, certain areas go out of agricultural production. So land becomes marginal. And on those areas, landholders might decide to plant trees, 
um, which are less labor intensive than annual crops, or they may simply allow the land to undergo the process of natural regeneration and, and go back to trees. Um, and um, of course, there could be interactions between the human population dynamics and this process of, of land use change, but I won't go into those details here. Transitions are um, particularly well known in the Northeastern US. If you ever find yourself in central Massachusetts, there was a wonderful little forestry museum, the Fisher Museum at the Harvard Forest that includes dioramas depicting uh, land use change in New England. Um, with the arrival of European colonists, uh, forests were cleared for small holdings. Uh, this is a process that started in the 1600s. Um, by the 1700s, um, early 1800s, something like 85% of the landscape had been cleared of forests and it started off by being uh, nearly 100% forested. As um, the industrial revolution came in and, and mill towns grew up, um, farmers started leaving the land and uh, some of them kept the land and planted trees, others abandoned the land and allowed it to go back to forest and that um, uh, created the uh, forests that we have in New England today. Now that's New England, that's the US, a high income country. How about in low and middle income countries? Uh, this is a very busy figure and I know this is hard to see um, the way that we're, I'm displaying the slide now, um, but let me take you through this. Um, we see evidence of transitions occurring. Um, what's going on in this slide, the dark green color indicates countries uh, low and middle income countries, there's 139 of them in this figure that have had an increase in total forest area between 2000 and 2020. And that's 30% of low and middle income countries. So we have a big chunk of low and middle income countries that have rising forest area. And uh, that's a pretty big number. And so you think that some economists might be interested in figuring out why that's happening. Um, the light green color indicates additional countries where there's an increase, has been an increase in planted forest area. Now there's an increase in planted forest area in some of the dark green countries as well. Looking across low and middle income countries, for those that have data, about 85% have increasing planted forest area during this period of 2000 to 2020. The um, turquoise color is countries that have declining agricultural area. Now, some countries with a declining agricultural area are the light green and the dark green ones. The turquoise are just the incremental countries. And all told, that's 40% of low and middle income countries. Now, of course, not all agricultural area that goes out of agriculture is going into forests. Some of it is going into urban areas. There are reasons for loss of forest, of agricultural land besides expansion of forest. But we have a large number of countries that have declining agricultural area. And finally, you see a few mustard colored countries. Those are countries with declining rural populations. And some of the countries that are colored, um, turquoise, light green or dark green also have declining rural populations. It's about 40% of low and middle income countries. Um, again, that's a large portion of low and middle income countries. So um, there are significant land use changes and land cover changes in low and middle income countries that are consistent with a, um, a process of forest restoration. And so um, uh, this is a, a big topic and uh, it seems one worthy of economists uh, to work on. Um, and I wanna emphasize these transitions are neither automatic nor fully understood. One thing that's revealed by the most recent data in the uh, UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization's forest resource assessment is that the planting of forests slowed down uh, during the last decade relative to the previous decade. So here are different regions of uh, the global south and the blue is the area of um, uh, planted forest during 2000, 2010. The orange tan color is during 2010, 220. And what you see in every region, um, especially in Asia, a decrease in the amount of planting. So there's a slowdown occurring and um, we really don't understand why this is occurring. That's the kind of topic that an economist could tackle. A second reason um, for uh, why I think economists should be interested um, is that we have a lot better data today and better methods than we did 20 or so years ago when there actually was quite a bit of work by economists on um, 
on reforestation, afforestation, tree planting. Uh, so much work that Subrendu Patanayak, um, uh, whom you know is, is on this call, um, uh, was able to write a review paper with several others about this topic. And that's a review paper from some 20 years ago. Um, today, we have better data than were available at that time. We have data from satellites and other remote sensing platforms. Um, we have a much larger body of survey data uh, from the Living Standards Measurement Studies uh, conducted by the World Bank, FAO, and their country uh, counterparts. And we also have an improved set of methods for evaluating uh, programs, uh, the range of experimental and quasi-experimental impact evaluation methods. Um, so uh, there's been interest in the past. There were uh, topics that were investigated and um, we have better data and methods um, if for no other uh, purpose to go back and revisit some of these topics. And in fact, at the end, I'll show you examples of some studies that have done that and turned up some results that I think are a bit surprising. A third reason for economists uh, to be interested is that restoration is costly. Um, this is a, um, a picture from a report by the UN and FAO, which estimated that it would cost 100, uh, sorry, US 1 trillion to restore 350 million hectares. Um, and that's referring largely to forests. Um, the picture is somewhat incongruously of a coral reef, which are, coral reefs are important to restore as well, but um, this number refers to uh, primarily to terrestrial um, restoration. Um, that's a big number. Um, where's the money going to come from? We know that government budgets are stressed. Government budgets in low and middle income countries were stressed pre-COVID um, and getting worse, getting more stressed. Um, uh, deficits were increasing. Uh, deficits have fallen off a cliff uh, since the, uh, the pandemic. And we know that very little official development assistance flows to forestry. The left bar is this estimate of restoration cost. Uh, expressed um, in billion dollars per year. The middle bar is official de development assistance flowing to all environmental programs. And the last bar is the slice that goes to agricultural, forestry, and fisheries. Um, so we don't see very large aid flows going to forestry, much less specifically to forest restoration. Um, it's important in this context to use scarce available funds cost effectively. And this is a topic that economists are skilled at investigating. And in fact, some have. Uh, there's a nice study in Nature, Ecology and Evolution two years ago by Bernardo Strasberg and others with the International Institute for Sustainability, which looked at the Atlantic forest region of Brazil, um, uh, uh, worked out the efficient frontier, what is the maximum amount of carbon sequestration and avoided extinctions that could be achieved under available resources, and then also compare that to what the amounts would be if the funds were allocated just randomly um, without taking into account their uh, efficient allocation. And there's a big gap here. And, and you know, this is the kind, of an economy, the kind of analysis that economists can do, which can point us toward ways to use the scarce, very scarce resources available for restoration in a more cost-effective way to get greater um, returns in terms of um, environmental impacts or um, impacts on livelihoods than if we don't take um, economics into consideration. Another role economists can play in this context of high costs and limited resources is to evaluate the potential for new sources of financing. It turns out that there is an existing global industry um, that involves investment in forest land. This is investment by institutions, pension funds, insurance companies, university endowments, and the like. Um, these sorts of institutions already invest ext extensively in forest land in North America, Oceania, and Europe. Um, in return for their investments, uh, they um, uh, get returns from harvesting the land, but also they are important players in forest carbon markets. Um, these are folks who get paid through carbon offset programs uh, for, to manage their forests to sequester more carbon. So this industry exists. But low and middle income countries in Latin America, especially in Asia and Africa, are not very large players in this. There's not much of this private investment flowing to them. Uh, the reason for this, reasons for this are laid out in a nice recent report um, by the World Bank, by Clark Binkley and, and um, Fiona Stewart and others. And this report um, even generates a map identifying countries that look like 
attractive ones for institutional investment, potentially attractive ones. And there is one country in uh, Sandy's region, uh, India, uh, which this reports as being a potentially attractive one for this form of investment. Again, uh, the kind of work economists can do is to evaluate these potential new sources of, of financing and determine uh, just how viable they are. Um, and if economists don't do it, it's unlikely that others will. Uh, the fourth, fourth reason I'll give for why economists should be interested is that restoration is about people. The land that's potentially available for restoration almost always belongs to or is being used by someone, an individual, a household, a community, a company. Those parties decide whether to restore forest on the land spontaneously or in response to government policies and programs. Their decisions have impacts on their well being and potentially the well being of others. The, uh, these decisions and their impacts could vary by age, gender, ethnicity, income class, education, and other factors. Economists are better able than most other scientists to investigate these decisions and their impacts. And so it's um, uh, per, I would argue the most important reason why economists should be involved in research on restoration. We're especially well placed to um, work on the human dimension of restoration. Now, how important are people um, in this? Um, there's a paper in preparation led by Priya Shamsunder, a uh, paper's titled Scaling Smallholder Tree Cover Restoration in the Tropics. Um, one um, thing this, this paper did was to identify areas of, of land where low cost restoration is possible. And low cost here is defined as where a cost of carbon of no more than $20 per ton would make restoration feasible, uh, would make the land more uh, valuable under tree cover than under um, other uses. It uh, looked at the uh, current land cover, um, the largest of the some uh, uh, five, more than 500 million hectares, more than half a billion hectares of land. The largest component is cropland, uh, followed by pasture land, and then finally degraded forest. And you see in these maps, uh, the distribution of those areas within the tropics. And you also see estimates of the number of people who are located um, in proximity to, the, proximity to these potential restoration sites. And you know, this is a large number of people, nearly 300 million people. Uh, so restoration does involve people. And many of these people are smallholders. Down here is a, is a map and the darker shading shows um, among these countries with low cost restoration, the percent of smallholders. And um, especially in Asia, a large portion of agricultural land is held by smallholders. And in fact, we see a big distinction between Asia and Africa compared to the neotropics where smallholders are, uh, um, hold a relatively small portion of total land. So a, um, an interesting finding from this paper. Um, so, so people are involved. Now, if people are involved and they have different ways they can use their land, a question is where will the funding come from to create large scale incentives for them to restore forest on their land? Um, because if there's not a, a source of uh, financing to them, if they're not earning a, a return from restoration, then there's not a strong incentive to restore forest on the land. Now, one possibility that we might think of is some form of payment for ecosystem services program funded by a national or other government. Um, and we do have a good example of this approach, and that's the sloping lands conversion program in China, the largest payment for ecosystem services program in the global south and perhaps the biggest anywhere in the world. Uh, between 1999 and 2015, uh, the government of China spent nearly $70 billion. Um, and in, uh, um, as a result of that, um, uh, restored forest on some 15 million hectares. Uh, this was restoration on uh, lands held by smallholder farming households and some 32 million smallholder farming households were involved. So this is, um, clearly a large scale program. I put a question mark on the title up here because I'm skeptical about the potential for rolling out more of these really big government programs under current conditions uh, for the reasons given earlier, um, the uh, debt that most uh, low and middle income countries are facing, the small share of ODA that's going toward um, 
uh, forestry uh, programs. And of course, restoration competes for other kinds of forestry programs. Now, I'm not saying there will be none of these programs. We know that there are examples. Uh, Pakistan has the billion tree tsunami. Um, so there will be some of these programs in some places, but I don't think we can count on these as a um, major source of funding for large scale restoration to the tune of a billion or two billion hectares of, of uh, forest. How about carbon payments? I said at the outset that much of the motivation for the current interest in forest restoration pertains to climate mitigation. Well, um, here I'm uh, again skeptical um, under current conditions. Let me emphasize that I'm, I'm speaking in terms of what the situation currently is. Government commitment to action on climate change we know is spotty. Um, uh, you know, there are some reasons for optimism from Glasgow, but still we have very few jurisdictions at the national, state or municipal level that have requirements to limit carbon emissions. And this is a map of those jurisdictions. We see lots of gray spots across the globe where there are no um, uh, mandatory government requirements to limit carbon emissions. If we look at programs that allow carbon offsets, that allow an emitter to um, pay, say, for forest restoration to sequester carbon there, that's an even smaller number of jurisdictions. So the gray area in this map is larger compared to the previous one. This shows the jurisdictions that allow for offsets. And by the way, not all these offsets are necessarily forest offsets. There are other offsets that can be allowed. And now there is, there is activity outside of um, government programs, of course, outside of the regulated or, or mandatory uh, programs. Um, in part due to frustration by the slow action by governments, a number of voluntary programs have been created. And this provides some information on those programs. Disregard this uh, dotted line, uh, which suggests uh, progress occurring. That's just the cumulative volume of carbon offsets in voluntary programs. Uh, it's more meaningful to look at what's happening year to year from um, before 2005 through 2019. Basically, there was no growth in voluntary programs. The numbers bounced around at around um, 80, um, oh, what is this, um, million metric tons um, of, of carbon. The last two years, we've seen a sharp increase. Uh, you know, maybe that will continue. So maybe here's a bright spot. But until recently, anyway, we didn't see much growth in voluntary programs. So this is some information on uh, the scope of programs and uh, their size. But if we're talking about landholders, the issue is what are they gonna get paid? And remember, I asked you to remember a couple of numbers uh, from the, the Griscom slide, um, $10 and $100. $100 being the estimate from that study of the uh, carbon price required to meet the two degree centigrade temperature goal of the uh, Paris Agreement. A uh, $10 per ton being an estimate of low cost uh, uh, carbon offset projects. Well, what are the actual prices that are occurring in these markets? Um, you definitely can't see this, and my apologies for having to present this um, uh, in, in the current fashion, but I can read the numbers to you. So these are red projects, uh, $4 a ton. Um, over here, we have improved forest management projects, $8 a ton. For the afforestation and reforestation projects, $7 per ton. We're well below uh, the levels that are um, estimated um, as being required for serious action on climate change. This particular report, uh, which is from the World Bank, reports estimates of uh, $40 to $80 a ton of carbon being required to meet the 2% temperature goal. Of course, there's uncertainty about that. You know, is it 40, 80, 100? Um, we're not sure, but we do know that these numbers are well above what current prices are um, for forest uh, projects. And these are, these are estimates for 2019. I actually dug out slightly more recent numbers, uh, rounding things out with 2021, 2020 and 2020, 2021 numbers. The red box over here um, for afforestation reforestation prices bumped up a little bit in 2020 to about ten dollars a ton, ton but fell back back to about eight dollars a ton in 2021 so we got low prices um, so you know hopefully someday we will have more serious action on climate change and higher carbon prices but right now the prices are are pretty low um, and uh, too low to provide incentive for the large-scale restoration that biophysically appears to be possible Here's a third possibility, wood markets. 
uh, forests produce commercial products. Um, you know, forests produce uh, fuel wood, which is an important fuel source um, uh, for uh, people and communities around the world. Half of global harvest worldwide um, is wood that's used for fuel. So this is a major product that comes out of the, of the world's forests. Um, uh, forests produce um, uh, logs that get produced, turned into lumber and, and plywood. They produce uh, pulp wood, which gets turned into pulp and paper. And of course, these are all products that are very important to us. Um, how about wood markets? Well, um, the problem here is that the world is not running out of wood, um, which is a fact that is little understood. Um, uh, we often get quite depressed about the state of the world running out of resources. Well, one resource that we're actually not running out of is wood. And this is despite the fact that there is ongoing deforestation. Um, UN FAO Forest Resource Assessment, Assessment estimates growing stock in the world's forests. You know, think of this as the amount of wood in the forest that could be used, uh, could be harvested and used for the types of products I just mentioned. Uh, worldwide, uh, there's basically been no trend over the last 30 years. Growing stock has remained constant. If we look at just Asia, of course, the total is lower. Asia is just one portion of the world, but that's actually increased. There is more wood in the forest in Asia than there was 30 years ago. Um, you know, how has this happened, given that there's been massive growth in human population and massive um, growth in incomes during this period that we'd expect to stimulate additional demand uh, for wood products? Well, it's, it's happened because of the success of foresters um, in managing natural forests in ways that make them more productive. You get more wood being generated off of a given hectare of, of natural forest that's managed uh, for wood production, uh, but also the expansion of plantation areas, um, planted forests, which account for only 7% of global forest land, but uh, yield 50% of wood production. Uh, so foresters are unsung heroes in this uh, result. So uh, we're not running out of wood. And a uh, consequence of this is that we're not seeing much movement in prices uh, that uh, landowners receive for wood products. Now, this is looking historically over the uh, first part of the 20th century. During that period, stumpage prices, those are the prices that forest um, uh, owners receive if they harvest their timber those did increase over and above inflation. And those of you who've studied some resource economics um, might uh, look at these numbers if you can read them. Um, the, the, uh, the first one is 5% per year. That's during the first half of the 20th century. That's comparable to estimates of the long run return on capital in the stock market. And you might think, huh, that seems kind of like a hoteling model. Um, if we have a non-renewable resource, we expect the marginal um, rent to rise at the rate of discount, at the opportunity cost of capital. And that's exactly what was going on. Uh, the first part of the century, wood harvests were coming from old growth forests, which are non-renewable resources effectively. But as the century went on, more and more second growth forests and plantations came in. That dampened the increase in stumpage prices. And then we get to the last 30, 40 years, and there has been no ongoing change in these prices. They've been flat. So again, evidence that the world's not running out of wood. We are in this, this um, equilibrium where what we uh, grow is what we harvest and prices are flat. So this creates, um, um, th this reduces then the incentive for landholders to restore forests if the prices of the wood they receive when they harvest are not going up. Now they still get a return from the growth of the trees, but there's not some additional return from um, rising prices. Now, of course, there could be local scarcities. Um, most low and middle income countries are net importers of wood. Um, the countries that are shaded either green or yellow here are ones that import wood. Uh, darker green are the larger importers, lighter uh, and, and um, yellow are the, uh, the smaller importers. So it could be that in some of these locations, we have scarcities that are causing upward pressure on um, the prices that uh, forest holders receive when they harvest their forests. Um, but globally, there's, there are not uh, those sorts of scarcities. Um, so if, if that's the case, how could we create incentives, uh, more of a market incentive for um, uh, forest restoration? Well, it would be through um, uh, promoting greater use of wood products. I'm gonna show you some results from um, a study by Alice Favero and others published in Science Advances um, going on two years ago. Um, 
they took one of the leading models of the global forest sector. This is the global timber model. And first they ran a simulation of business as usual. Suppose that uh, there are no particular policies to promote greater use of forest products, that um, any increased demand comes from population growth and uh, economic growth leading to higher incomes. In that case, what happens over the coming century is that um, for a period of time, short period of time, forest area decreases, but then it comes back up. Um, but by the end of the century, we're basically where we are today. And so, you know, we're kind of achieving stability. We're not getting a net increase in forest area. So just letting markets work their magic um, stabilizes forest area, but is not, does not lead to a net increase in forest area. So again, we're not seeing um, uh, increases on the, the order of a half billion, a billion, two billion hectares of the, the sort that seem to be biophysically possible. Um, if there's to be an increase in forest area driven by demand for forest products, then it's going to have to come from uh, promotion of new uh, uses of wood. And we know there are several ways we can use wood, more wood than we currently do. Um, engineers and architects have developed ways of building high-rise buildings out of wood. Um, engineers and chemists have developed ways of producing plastics from renewable wood fiber. And uh, increasingly, we see um, efforts to use wood as a renewable energy source uh, to replace uh, a coal and other non-renewables. In the study by Favero et al., they looked at this last option. Um, what if 10% of global energy supply uh, were to come from woody biomass. So suppose we um, replace 10% uh, of what's coming predominantly from uh, non-renewable fossil fuels with woody biomass in um, sustainably managed forests, natural forests and plantations. And let's do this in the context of a scenario where we limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. The consequence of that is that we see increases in harvests in uh, the world's forests, um, pretty much across all parts of the world. And here in Asia, we see a relatively dark green color, which suggests significant increases in harvest there. What's the consequence of those, those increased harvests? Well, those increased harvests are associated with higher prices being received by forest owners, those are by landowners. Those higher prices encourage landowners to convert their land from agriculture croplands and pasture land to forest. And so the, uh, the price sends a signal that the land is relatively more valuable for forest. And what you should look at here is the black line. Uh, this is the line that has to do with the 1.5 degree uh, centigrade target. And what's shown on the vertical axis here is change in total forest area relative to that baseline of business as usual, no increased use of woody biomass. And under this policy of greater demand for um, wood in this, this use, um, we've got um, an increase of about 1.1 billion hectares of forest land. Okay, so market-driven um, demand for wood could create an incentive to um, lead to the net uh, restoration of uh, more than a billion hectares of forest land by 2020, by 21, um, as estimated by this study. That's total forest land. Um, now, are there trade-offs? Sure, there are always trade-offs. If we look at natural forest area, and here this means forest that is not harvested. So think of this as forest that's just left on its own under natural conditions. Um, that, uh, that declines um, as a result of this policy. And that's because some natural forests go from being unharvested to being harvested and kept as natural forests, but they are being harvested on a recurrent basis. Um, so this kind of policy would need to be coupled with some effort to protect um, remaining areas of old growth forests. And those are important uh, for a range of environmental services. But even if we protect those, we're still coming out ahead by about 900 million uh, hectares. So um, it, it appears there is potential through markets um, if uh, um, there are policies to promote greater use of, of wood products or these products just on their own manage to outcompete other products. Now, I've been talking just now about policy interventions in the forest sector, um, but uh, it, it's clear that to promote large-scale restoration, there will be uh, there's a need for policy interventions 
more broadly speaking. This is a, a, a figure that's from this paper by Priya Shamsinder and others. And it um, evaluates the top 20 uh, uh, countries in the tropics, top 20 in terms of the, um, their restoration potential at uh, the lower cost, the $20 um, per ton of carbon, and evaluates from, from the standpoint of their position with respect to various uh, policies and um, institutions. Very few of these have nationally determined uh, commitments uh, to climate change. And then over here, these four bars, um, if the countries were in the top quartile globally, they'd be shaded dark like this, this almost black color. None of them are shaded that dark. So none of these countries are in the top quartile in terms of being attractive from the standpoint of overall governance, security of tenure, the enabling environment for um, agriculture, um, which would carry over to forestry um, or uh, investments by landholders or proximity to markets, which would be important for um, uh, forest products, getting inputs into grow trees and getting the products out. Um, so there, there's, there's certainly a, a need for additional investments in infrastructure and also policy uh, changes to uh, uh, make investments in forest restoration in rural areas more attractive. I've, I've said quite a lot and I wanna wrap up um, by just making a statement of two broad needs for economic research and then giving you some examples, some recent examples of work along these lines. Um, broadly speaking, um, uh, economists can uh, do work of two sorts. Uh, we can look at the past. Uh, we can do retrospective analyses of projects, programs, policies, that have been implemented uh, and are directly or indirectly related to forest restoration. We can evaluate the impacts of those interventions, uh, their environmental impacts and also their um, impacts on people. We can also look ahead. Uh, we can use tools that we've developed such as discrete choice experiments, field experiments, pilot auctions, randomized control trials to test different features of potential interventions that are aimed to promote forest restoration and thereby um, help to ensure that the interventions are more cost-effective and more effective, uh, uh, stand a greater chance of actually restoring forests and having the intended positive impacts on uh, people. Um, I'll give you some examples here. And these slides on the left, I've got something off in a table, a figure, a map, or something like that. I don't intend for you to read these. These are just intended to make my slides look slightly more interesting. Um, if you're intrigued, you can look up papers and learn more. And hopefully you will be intrigued by some of these studies. Um, again, this is just a sampler. There's, um, although the body of work is small relative to the work done by others, scientists on restoration and small compared to the work done by economists on deforestation, there has been work done and, and much of it has yielded very interesting results. This is a study in China, um, which took a fixed effects model and looked at the impacts of tenure reform on forest area in China. And the tenure reform here was to convert community forest land to de facto private forest land, uh, giving households rights um, to use of the land. And the result of this uh, decollectivization, this essentially privatization of forest land was to increase forest cover. And so the tenure reform resulted in an increase in forest cover in the areas where it occurred. A second study, um, also of a retrospective sort, um, looks at commercial wood production, wood plantations in Brazil, um, in a southeastern state in Brazil. And one in, in the literature, there's been uh, quite a bit of debate about the impacts of commercial wood plantations on local communities. Um, much of the literature, particularly the more um, a journalistic portion of the literature as opposed to the rigorous research has claimed that plantations have impoverished local communities. Um, this study by Afonso and Miller uh, takes an impact evaluation approach, a fixed effects model, um, and looks at the impacts of commercial wood plantations on local communities. And it finds that actually these plantations have been associated with a reduction in poverty in the local communities. Um, so the introduction of this new form of production not only puts more trees on the surface and thereby um, uh, provides important provisioning services and increases the 
amount of carbon that's, that's on the land. It has also uh, benefited local communities in terms of reducing poverty. Let's look at some of the forward-looking studies. Um, here's a study from Indonesia. Um, this is a discrete choice experiment, which looked at a hypothetical a smallholder uh, outgrower scheme for pulpwood plantations in Indonesia. Now, I, I mentioned that much of the land in Asia that potentially can be restored is held by smallholders. Now, there are scale economies to forest restoration. Um, investors want to see larger tracts of land. Governments would like to see larger tracts of land because of the scale economies. And what a number of private companies have done is to create schemes whereby they organize smallholders. Um, and uh, you know, in, into these um, into these groups, and you know, uh, provide them guaranteed markets, provide them technical assistance, and um, these have um, uh, proved to be viable ways of recruiting tens of thousands of smallholders in, in some cases to grow wood to uh, uh, supply to um, forest products manufacturers. Now, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, there was a uh, fairly robust literature on smallholder schemes. Um, in forestry, those have basically been forgotten, but recently there's been a renewal of interest in them. And I think that's important uh, given that uh, so much of the potentially restorable land is held by smallholders. And in this study uh, by Permati and others, um, they looked at different features of the scheme, tried to understand the preferences of local landholders. And what they found was that local landholders fall into three groups. And so um, a one-size-fits-all scheme is, is not likely to work. Instead, what are needed are three types of schemes. One that aims at wood production, pure and simple. One that aims at the development of livelihoods uh, for the households and communities. And a third that aims at conservation. So the preferences of landholders vary, and thereby the design of the outgrower scheme should vary as well. Another uh, prospective study, forward-looking, uh, this is done by one of my colleagues at uh, Duke, Heather Huntington, and a, a colleague of hers. Uh, this is a randomized controlled trial of tree planting in Zambia. And uh, this is an interesting RCT. Um, it looked at the effects of technical assistance through information and training, and also through strengthening of tenure. Um, this is an area where landholders were concerned about the insecurity of their rights. They have customary use rights, but they're concerned that uh, their land could be taken away. And so it was an, an intervention that involved community mapping of their parcels. And as a result of that mapping, the landholders reported that they did feel more secure about their, their land holdings. However, that increased security did not affect tree planting. Um, uh, and and a, sort of a, a received um, fact or stylized fact in the literature has been that strengthening tenure will lead to more investment in agriculture, including in tree planting. It was found here that it wouldn't. And the reason for that is it, it seems that um, uh, uh, restrictions around tenure are not really the binding constraint. Uh, the binding constraint has to do with, with knowledge and, and uh, technical assistance uh, need for help. And the uh, treatment arm of this RCT that involved technical assistance did result in increased tree planting. Uh, so from this study, we're, we're learning more about the circumstances under which um, stronger tenure uh, does or does not lead to increased investment in trees. Here's a pair of studies uh, from Africa, uh, both pilot auctions, um, one from Tanzania, one from Kenya. And um, in, in, I, I like these as a pair. Um, because they, they uh, get at distributional effects of payments for ecosystem services for forest restoration. And in these cases, the payments were allocated via auctions. And so the uh, payments went to the landholders who bid the lowest amounts uh, to be compensated to restore trees. And what was found in the pilot auction in Tanzania, and that's a study by Jindal et al., was that auction outcomes tended not to be pro-poor better off households were more likely to win those auctions. And one reason for that is that better off households tend to have larger land and their scale economies to forest restoration, as I mentioned a moment ago. However, and this comes from the Kenya study by Andeltova et al., um, the um, auctions tended to be um, pro-female. Uh, women were more likely uh, to win them. So it may be that we see differences um, along pro-social lines, that some interventions may uh, be pro-poor but not pro-female, or the reverse may be true. 
The last I'll, I'll mention here is a study by Paulina Oliva and others published in the Review of Economics and Statistics a year ago. Another RCT, also from Africa, most of the RCTs on forest restoration have come from Africa. Uh, this is uh, also in Zambia, as the study by Heather Huntington was. And an uh, interesting feature of this um, is that it, it suggests that there is a budgetary trade-off in forest restoration programs. So uh, we want landholders to participate in these programs. We want them to uh, purchase or accept seedlings and then plant them, but we want the seedlings to survive. Um, um, restoration is not just about uh, planting seedlings or initially creating conditions for natural regeneration. It's ensuring that planted seedlings and naturally regenerated forests persist. Um, and so the, the trade-off here is that uh, if you want to get more, you want to get greater participation, then you need to have higher subsidies um, uh, for the, the cost of the seedlings, higher subsidies to make it cheaper for landholders to purchase the seedlings. But if you want the, the seedlings to survive, then you have to have higher bonus payments linked to the survival of those seedlings. So there's a trade-off here. Spend more money on subsidizing the seedlings, uh, more um, farmers plant uh, the seedlings, but they don't necessarily um, um, uh, you know, ensure that they survive. So to get survival, you have to have bonus payments later. And this sort of trade-off is exactly the sort of trade-off that economists are skilled at evaluating. And let me say that uh, one of the great um, uh, areas where more work is needed is on the persistence of, of regenerated forests, whether they're planted or naturally regenerated, how long do they last? And um, you know, we, we don't have great data on that yet or very many studies that look at longer time periods. Um, okay, my last slide, and this is just to say that if any of what I just talked about interests you, then that's good because there is more research on these topics underway. And I wanna draw your attention to some uh, work that's in progress that uh, you'll be seeing within the next um, few years. Uh, Sandy has underway six studies in the countries shown here. Uh, six studies on the economics of forest restoration, and it has proposed four studies to IDRC um, in uh, some of the same countries, but also adding to the list Bhutan. The Environment for Development Initiative has recently um, funded a study in Uganda on economics of forest restoration. FAO has a study underway in Uganda on economics of forest restoration that is similar to that study in Brazil that I mentioned earlier. That was the study uh, which looked at the uh, cost-effective frontier for restoring forests. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, U.S. Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, or to think, um, uh, a year ago approved a project that I'm co-PI on, uh, which um, has uh, studies underway in Brazil, China, Guatemala, and Malawi, as well as a global analysis. Uh, so there is work underway. There's, there's more um, um, uh, that, that's... Um, that's happening, um, but I hope many of you will be interested because the amount of work that economists are doing on this topic, which I hope you'll agree is important, um, is still relatively low. So with that, I will end and thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your uh, questions. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, uh, that was a very stimulating and interesting uh, um, you know, talk. Um, so let me then open the floor for questions and queries. Um, so there are about, you know, 20 questions uh, or so in the in the in the um, in the Q and A chat. And what I've tried to do is sort of collate them into topics. But before we get into substantive discussion. There are a couple of uh, things that uh, the participants wanted to know, and I'm ho I'm guessing we can make these resources sort of available. One is that there is there are questions about the availability of your slides. So is it possible for us to post the slides somewhere, Maniji or Jeff? Would you be uh, interested in sharing your slides? I'm certainly happy to share the slides. The the slide deck is fairly large, so I'd suggest not emailing it, but if we can post it on the Sandy website and make it available for download, uh, that would be great. I'm happy to make it available. Also, the, um, 
review article that I mentioned from the annual review of Envi environment and resources, that is open access. So we could post that as well if people want to, to look at that. And that covers much of the same ground, not all of it, but much of it, and also has complete citations for all of the works that I uh, cited in a more shorthand fashion. The session also is being recorded, right? So in theory, you could share that recording, Manny? Yes, it is right now live on YouTube, and you know the the link will be available. Uh, so we may need to edit some because there were some glitches, technical problems. So it will be available. And another related question was about you know data that you've mentioned, and also methodological advances you've mentioned, but especially the data that that uh, you know is freely available or. I, I remember in grad school when I was wanting to do some work on forestation and such, the data was was prohibitively expensive. So if it's if there is more freely available data, um, there was there is interest in finding out where to look for this kind of data. So um, yeah, I, I can comment on that. So I, I can think of of three sources of data. Okay. So the first would be journal articles. Um, these days, most journals are requiring authors to make their data publicly available. And you know, if you go to the end of an article typically, or sometimes it's at the beginning in a footnote, uh, you'll find information on a site that you can go to where you can obtain the data. Um, and you know, sometimes data have not been completely mined by the person who published a paper. You know, more, more value can be wrung out of the data. So that's one source. Um, another source is survey data. Um, I mentioned the living standards measurement studies by the World Bank FAO and their country partners. Uh, data from those are by and large freely available. There is a World Bank website and somebody can probably put that in the chat right now. And so you can access those data. A lot of the work that I'm doing under the Succinct project uh, with my collaborators is making use of, of those data. Uh, there are even, there's a, a compiled version of that data set um, by FAO, it's called the RULIS data, uh, where they went through um, most of the LSMF, uh, LSMS studies and uh, pulled in the data from all these separate studies and created a single large database, um, which is in a Stata data set. So those of you who use Stata, it's ready to go. Um, so that's available. Um, I can uh, track down the link for that. The University of Washington has similarly compiled uh, some of the, the, uh, the data from the LSMS surveys, as well as DHS uh, surveys. So there's survey data out there, and those data are available to you, okay? Um, maybe not you know, from your country, but from some other countries, hopefully from your country. The third source is data from remote sensing. Um, now, um, here there have been great advances which are really important for restoration. Um, uh, most of these data are publicly available. Uh, the um, uh, NASA in the United States, um, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, the European Space Agency um, make available data that are pre-classified. So they've been classified according to land use. And these data are reasonably uh, well resolved, finely resolved, um, like the, the ESA data, which is I, which is mostly what I use when I'm using medium resolution data. That's at 300 meters, and it's classified to land cover, uh, crop, and then it distinguishes between annual and perennial. Many different categories of, of forest, urban is split out. That's all free. So if you uh, know how to use GIS, um, and by the way, uh, GIS is free now too. Um, ArcGIS, long time, long the leading uh, platform, um, now has a competitor in the free, uh, you know, the um, uh, freeware space, which is QGIS. Uh, so learn GIS, you've got free software and you've got free data, medium resolution from ESA and from from NASA, um, and there are other data sets that individual researchers have uh, prepared. But a, a challenge for forest restoration is that it can be early to it can be hard to detect early on when trees are growing back. So we need finer resolution data. Um, just within the last year, uh, the Norwegian government made a deal with Planet.com. Planet.com is one of the leading uh, commercial satellite companies that has very high resolution uh, instruments, uh, sub meter uh, data, and uh, the Norwegian government has made available not the sub meter data but data at 4.77 meters. So this is, you know, this is pretty, pretty fine scale. 
Um, and that is freely available. If you Google NICFI, N-I-C-F-I, do NICFI and throw in forest, you'll be taken to the website and you can register uh, to use these data. Um, and so th this makes it much more possible to do the studies that will enable us to detect whether trees are coming back on a site. Um, uh, with the coarser level data, the you know, 300 meter data, um, or even you know, 30 meters, um, it's, you know, it's gonna be much harder to determine if um, we're actually seeing trees coming back or not. And you know, frankly, this is one reason, I think why economists have focused so much on deforestation. Um, it's easy to detect when the greenery goes away. It's much harder to detect when it's coming back. So those are some thoughts on, on free data. And I, I hope that um, those, those suggestions are helpful. Uh, I'm sure um, people will be able to harness these, these types of data. Um, second set of questions was about the, the, the sort of quality of, of the forest. So, so you mentioned in your slides in the last 10 years, it seems like, you know, the forest cover seems to be going down. So th there was this thought whether, whether the, be, there's a focus, a shift from quantity to quality and does that matter uh, for the benefits? And also a related question was about the type of vegetation. So is that um, sort of important as well or is it just the, the quantum of forests? Yeah, uh, great questions. I, I was hoping that someone would ask that. Um, first of all, to be clear on what the slide showed, it showed that the rate of planting was going down. Uh, planted forests are still increasing. Okay, the area is increasing. It's just that there's been a, a slowdown. Uh, countries, um, on average, are not planting as much forest as they had been. Um, as I said, the, the reason for this is not well understood um, because I, I think no one realized there had been this slowdown until FAO came out with the latest forest resource assessment and, and these data are shown in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so we don't know what's, what's going on. Is this a result of a shift from you know, quantity to quality? Um, I, I'm, I'm not so sure it's that. My guess would be that this has something to do with recovery from the Great Recession. Um, it may also have to do with the fact that, you know, the, the low hanging fruit, as it were, has been plucked, that um, the, you know, the, the trees have been planted um, in the areas where under current market conditions, and again, you know, wood prices as received by forest owners are not going up. We may just have exhausted the areas where um, planting is commercially viable. Um, you know, maybe that's going on, but we, we, we don't know. And, and I think this is important to find out. Um, type of forest, uh, does it matter? Absolutely, okay, absolutely matters. Um, and here there are trade-offs. Um, and, and there are also links to the incentives for uh, growing the forest. If we want to achieve large scale uh, restoration, then that means we have to have a large pot of money to do it. And you know, that can be a pot of money that's coming from governments or um, uh, aid agencies, uh, nonprofit organizations, or can be coming from markets, right? Somewhere there has to be a financial incentive. I mean, there has to be real money that landholders are receiving to be um, um, uh, incentivized to convert their land from its current non-forest uses to, to forest. Um, now, if you know, it would be wonderful if we were in a world where there were enough money to pay those folks to reestablish forests that include all of the original species, okay, and in all their richness. I mean, I would love to be in that world. I just don't think we're in that world. I don't think there is enough funding to do that. And if we emphasize um, restoration that, in, that relies only on native species that tries to put everything back in place, we're gonna end up restoring a much smaller portion of the, the earth's surface, okay? And, and that's a trade-off, you know, that, that may be what, what some people want. And, you know, what is best is not for me to say, but, but there is a trade-off there. Um, the, the scarce available data indicates that restoring a forest that has more species um, in it uh, tends to be more expensive. That is, if we're, if we're doing this by planting, um, and landholders tend to be less inclined to do that because it is more costly. Um, so there, uh, there are trade-offs here. 
And yes, not every forest provides the same mix of goods and services. And I've long been a proponent of thinking in landscape level terms to not expect every hectare of forest land to produce everything. Uh, let's have some areas where we emphasize the production of wood and really you know, go at that in a very serious way, manage the forest to produce um, a, a large amount of wood um, on, uh, uh, on, on shorter cycles. Um, and if we do that, then that means that there's potentially a larger area that could be set aside for management for a broader range of ecosystem services, you know, set aside just for pure protection. Um, so um, um, is there a quality versus quantity trade-off? Sure, uh, there is. Um, and um, you know, we have limited funding and we want to use that funding to optimize uh, achievement of sub-objectives. And there will be debate about what those objectives should be, how important should be the impacts on local livelihoods, how important should be the impacts on biodiversity, how important should be the impacts on, on carbon, okay? Uh, you know, there is reason to have debate about these things because different people um, value these different goods and services in different ways. Um, uh, so yeah, definitely trade-offs here. I, I think that's a good segue into the next theme of questions, which was to do with the cost and benefits of, of um, forest restoration. So on the cost side, um, there was a question about, you know, there, there being private costs of restored forests, like, um, you know, uh, animals who, who then thrive in the forest and they can be predators for the farmers or the crop can get affected because of the, the, the forest cover. So to what extent are these private costs sort of also um, taken into account or is there work sort of um, this, you know, assessing these types of costs when the forests are fully restored? And then, you know, how, how do we think about sustainability if there are these kinds of costs? And on the benefit sides, there are co-benefits, uh, uh, you know, like biodiversity and, and so, um, you know, what, what are your um, thoughts about these co-benefits being important? And is there an information gap about these um, co-benefits that sort of uh, um, leads to less restoration? Okay, uh, great questions. I, I think I can say more about the second one than the, the first one. The, the first one being about I guess, um, negative externalities of forest restoration. If you restore a forest, then that forest could provide, provide uh, habitat for animals that might damage neighboring farmers' crops. And you know, there is a literature on um, conflicts between farmers and wildlife. Uh, I don't know that literature well. I know that Sandy has uh, supported some great work on it, and there, there is a broader literature out there. I don't know how much of the recent work on forest restoration has taken that potential negative externality into account. Um, but um, is it worthwhile considering? Um, sure, I mean, we should be considering all forms of, of externalities. Um, you know, restoration may have impacts on site, but it also very likely has impacts off site as well. And we should understand what those are. Um, you, you, I guess in this question was also a question about um, impacts on food. And so if land gets restored to forest, maybe the thought was we're losing land for crop production and there could be negative consequences for food security. Um, yes, and that that is a topic that has received quite a bit of attention. And I think is a reason that is giving some organizations pause um, as to the degree to which they should support forest restoration. It's a reason also why some of these studies have left out cropland, they have not included them. They've viewed those as, as not suitable for forest restoration. Um, my view on this is that we really don't understand um, very well yet how great the trade-off is between uh, forest restoration and food security. There is a, a well-known and very well-done study a couple of years ago by Peña Lovano and others that was published in Environmental Resource Economics, I believe, which looked at the consequences for global food security of achieving a really large scale uh, forest restoration target along the lines of a billion hectares or something. And what it found was that food prices go through the roof, they, roof, they spike dramatically. And the conclusion of the article was that the, you know, no government will support forest restoration if the impacts on 
food prices and therefore food security are as predicted by that study. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a true statement about what would happen if those sorts of spikes came about, but I'm not sure, sure that they will come about. Um, that particular model, the, the, the GTAP model, uh, Global Trade, Agriculture and Production Model is you know, a leading model of the global um, food sector, but the regions in it are pretty coarse, you know, like entire countries or groups of countries. And I don't think that model has sufficient resolution to identify the locations within countries where the loss of food production is likely to be pretty low, you know, the, the areas with lower yields. Um, and so uh, I, I think we're, we're I, I'm not convinced yet that there is a really sharp trade off between forest restoration, large scale restoration and big impacts on food. Um, and one reason I think that is there was there was a study now a number of years ago in China, which used a, a finer scale resolution model for China and found that the impacts of the large scale restoration that's occurred in China had negligible impacts on food prices there. So that's that's a bit about the the externalities in terms of wildlife and, and crops uh, or food security on the benefits side, co-benefits. Um, yeah, and so this kind of gets at uh, I think an opportunity to to link up a market driven approach, or, or try to steer a market driven approach in a direction where we get more environmental benefits. And you know, let's say that to get large scale restoration, we are going to have to rely on wood markets or markets of some type to reach a wide range of you know, millions of smallholders to encourage them to um, grow more trees on their land. Well, those markets are on their own not going to create incentives to supply other goods and services from forests. And you know, maybe if even if we have land set aside to provide those goods and services, maybe that's not enough. Maybe we want some of the smallholder land to, you know, to sequester a bit more carbon, to be a little bit more biodiversity friendly. Um, how could you do that? Well, you could do that by coupling the markets uh, with payments for ecosystem services and have the, the payments uh, then not having to cover all the costs, but the payments are kind of a top up to nudge the forest landowner or landholder in a direction where there are um, more of the environmental benefits are being provided. And this in fact is exactly how carbon offset markets work in the California carbon market in, in the US. And so state of California um, has a, a, a cap on emissions and it allows companies to offset their emissions by investing in forest land. And um, and one way they do that is by making payments to forest landholders to lengthen their rotations, to not harvest their forests as early. And if you lengthen the rotations, then on average over time, there's more carbon on the site. And so the landholder is still getting paid by the market for the wood they produce. That creates the incentive for them to keep trees on their land, but they get this additional payment uh, through the California um, offsets program that causes them to change how they manage the forest. So coupling PES systems that are aimed at um, uh, uh, environmental benefits or the non-market benefits of forests with uh, market interventions, I think is a, an, an attractive um, uh, uh, system to look at. One of the costs, especially for, for you know, countries in Asia, that, that's very pertinent and partly because, you know, I, I, I do work in this area as, as well. So I wanted to, you know, pick your brain about this as well. One of the questions about a type of cost that I don't see discussed a lot in this literature is, you know, the, the sort of uh, pressure on other resources. So in the in the questions, um, uh, one of the posted questions was it, restoration of forests has been uh, has had a very sizable sort of negative effect on water resources. So what are your thoughts on, on you know, these sort of, you know, uh, we, uh, type of trade-offs where we were thinking of one environmental externality and trying to address it, but then we are impacting other resources? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have to be aware of this kind of negative externality, okay, which, you know, which it is. So, we may regrow uh, forests on the landscape, but the consequence of that might be a reduction in annual runoff from the landscape. You know, uh, because of the increased evapotranspiration from the forest, there is less water that makes its way into rivers and streams. Uh, you know, this is a, a well-known consequence of uh, uh, reforestation, afforestation. There's, there's a lot of hydrological literature on this. Um, 
it's 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 a complex topic, um, and uh, you know there are circumstances under which restoring forest cover can lead to increased flows during some parts of the year, uh, the, the dry season, you get higher base flow. Subrendu has done some great work on, on this topic, for example. Um, um, and there are circumstances where restoring forest cover can lead to increases in local precipitation. You know, we're still learning a lot about the relationships between forests and local climate. Um, but, but we know there are definitely circumstances where if you plant trees, um, there is likely going to be less water available uh, downstream. And so we should be aware of that consequence. And uh, because of it, there may be places where we decide not to restore trees. And, and, and this is not only planting them, but there may be places where we decide not to allow forests to naturally regenerate. We just wanna keep less vegetation in areas to ensure that there's enough water. Um, most of the studies on forest restoration rule out establishing forests in locations where forests do not naturally occur, locations such as grass, grasslands and, and dry shrublands. Um, you know, we could grow forests in those areas through irrigation, but if we do that, then we're using up scarce water. So I, I think in the forest restoration field, there's quite a bit of awareness about potential negative impacts on, on, uh, on water. Um, at least in, in the meetings I'm in, I always see that issue being raised. And I, I think in drier parts of, of the world, including much of South Asia, impacts on water are ones that should certainly be taken into account by anyone, including economists um, who aim to do comprehensive studies on whether restoration makes sense in the sense of benefits exceeding the costs. Ah. Another theme that sort of emerged in the q and questions posted was uh, related to financing of, um, you know, restoration efforts. And so um, the, the two types of questions that, that emerged were, one pertained to sort of, uh, you know, the laws in, in developing countries and governance issues. And so um, there are risks for investments. So how, how does one think about those? Um, where is finance going? And and what? And the other issue is is you know the time horizon of farmers as well. So you know it, that is to do with local investments by the farmers themselves. These efforts take a long time for for you know the benefits to accrue. So are the farmers taking? these types of uh, uh, long-term stands or is there need for sort of education to these farmers? So I think there they are these two parts to the question. One is sort of big, broad, um, you know, risks for large scale investments. And second is, you know, local investment by farmers themselves, the, 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 their time horizons and, and their incentives. Okay, uh, there's a lot there, and these are important topics, okay? Let me talk first about the, the kind of large-scale investment, and I, I had a couple slides that referred to this. I mean, there, there is an industry um, that um, you know, invests in forest land around the world, and the investors are institutions, as I mentioned, such as pension funds and insurance companies and university endowments, okay? They tend to be patient investors. Right. I mean, th these are not, um, you know, hedge fund uh, hedge funds. Right. So they have longer time horizons. You know, they're in the business of such things as life insurance. Um, you know, um, so they have liabilities that stretch out over um, over decades. Um, and, you know, pensions, uh, they're managing money on behalf of people who will be looking to use that money in retirement decades down the road. So they, they kind of naturally think about long time frames. And they have found forest land to be attractive for various reasons. Um, it's risk return profile. Uh, forest land investments tend not to be correlated with the stock market. And so if you think in terms of modern portfolio theory, forest land could be a nice thing to mix into your portfolio. And you know, the, the, this is what these, these fund managers do. Um, uh, they do care about risks. And the, the reason why much of the investment by this industry is in high income countries is because of various risks that uh, exist in low and middle income countries. And based on you know, evidence to date, where has the money flowed? Those risks are viewed as greater in Africa and Asia than in Latin America, because there is 
quite a bit of investment now by this sector in Latin America. So Asia and Africa are viewed as particularly high risk areas. Um, why is that the case? Um, let me just encourage you to take a look at that report by Clark Binkley, Fiona Stewart and others um, that um, provides a good um, primer on forest land investment by institutions, but also then zeroes in on issues in low and middle income countries, what some of the, um, the institutional and legal factors are and has some suggestions of ways of addressing some of those, those challenges. So I, I direct you to that report and that's, that's freely available um, from the World Bank website. In terms of the time horizon, um, okay, so uh, farmers, whether they're small holders or, or large holders, um, do care about time. And uh, you know, this is uh, one reason why um, I've been skeptical about natural regeneration, that is just leaving the land to come back on its own accord. You know, trees will grow back if we wait long enough, nature will run its course. Well, you know, landholders don't wanna wait a long time. And, you know, there's a reason why things get planted, you know, by planting and then tending, we can get plants to grow more quickly. Uh, you know, time is money. And so uh, time horizon matters. Um, if the trees take longer to yield a return, then it's less likely that uh, farmers are gonna to wanna to invest in those types of trees. And you know, there's evidence on this from some locations around the world. There was a nice study in Vietnam that looked at the planting of an accepted commercial species, um, an acacia species and a local native species. The acacia could be harvested on a much shorter cycle and there was a ready market for it. Whereas the, the local species uh, grows on a much slower rotation, more uncertain market. Guess what? You know, farmers don't want to grow the native species. It takes too long and the returns are too uncertain. They want to grow the exotic, the introduced species, because they get a return more quickly um, and it's a pretty viewed as a pretty certain return. So, yeah, I mean, smallholders are going to care about risks and returns. Um, and, you know, if tenure is uncertain, then generally we would think that would discourage longer term returns. You're less likely to be confident that you will be the one who reaps the benefits when those trees you know, get to be of age where they can be harvested or produce other products that, um, that provide value to them. Um, are, are farmers you know, completely unwilling to consider long time horizons? I mean, absolutely not. I mean, there are smallholders and large holders around the world who have invested in forest land, um, but typically it's the land that is less productive, right? They're, they're not going to put their most productive agricultural land where they're earning high returns from crops or their most productive pasture land under trees. It's gonna be the, the land that is uh, more marginal for their, those uses. And you know, in those cases, um, forestry can be worth the investment of, of time and, uh, um, and effort. Um, uh, you know, a, a key factor here is actually bringing the cost down. Um, you know, you have to have access to seeds or seedlings. Uh, again, natural regeneration, if we're looking at an area that's that's has been in crops for a long time, there may not be natural seed sources. So if you want to get a forest back, you have to plant, which means you have to have seeds or seedlings, which means there have to be nurseries. Those may not exist in many areas, or they may be too far to, to profitably access. Um, so, so there are, are certainly issues around returns and risks that smallholders uh, face, and we have to we have to tackle those um, if we want to create a setting in which smallholders or large holders, for that matter, will feel that it's in their interest to restore forests on their land. Um, so, I, then there are also a, a set of questions on. Um, solutions and and barriers to scale so for example i think you touched upon this uh, in your in your talk that one size fit all doesn't work and there's just you know a gamut of solutions and we have to think about local conditions and institutions um but but you know some of these other solutions like forest based enterprises or for agroforestry with aquaponics is there is there sort of a growing um consensus on, on the type of solutions that work or do not work? And, and then, you know, if there is, then, you know, what are the barriers to scale? What, how do we get to scale? Um, and if, you know, the scaling of one type of solution is, uh, uh, makes sense to begin with, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I don't think there's any consensus. Um, at least I, I don't see any. Um, 
of course, I'm, I'm not involved in, in every meeting that takes place everywhere. So there may be a consensus out there and I'm just not aware of it. Um, I think we really need to learn about um, the performance of past interventions, okay? Um, you know, what, um, under what circumstances have the different interventions that governments or nonprofit organizations, other entities have, have implemented, you know, under what circumstances have those achieved, you know, something like the intended outcome, you know, have resulted in persistent increases in tree cover, resulted in persistent positive impacts on the livelihoods of landholders or um, others who are in the vicinity of these areas. What have the impacts been on um, environmental services beyond just provisioning services such as the production of, of wood? I, I think we, there's a lot to learn about from what has been tried in the past. Um, and, and likewise, we need to experiment. Uh, we need to use the techniques that economists have developed to try to get a sense of you know, how to design interventions to be more effective, you know, choice experiments, pilot auctions, field experiments, RT, RCTs and the, and the like. So I, I think we need a lot more information. Um, with respect to scaling, um, this, uh, this paper I mentioned that Priya is leading um, is very much about scaling up in the context of smallholders. Um, there are some very sensible uh, uh, suggestions in there. I, I, I'm gonna hold off on going into the detail on those and, and just um, leave you on the edges of your seats for when that paper uh, comes out. Um, but the you know, scaling is, is definitely a challenge. I say it, 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 there is a connection uh, to financing, okay, not, you know, not everything is about finance, but finance is important. I think even if we get all of the, the conditions right, we straighten out issues around tenure so that landholders um, feel confident that um, you know, they will reap the return to longer term investments, including ones that, that relate to forests. You know, even if we get better infrastructure into areas where uh, trees can grow, even if we reduce um, or eliminate uh, or modify regulations that may be well intended, uh, such as regulations aimed at fighting deforestation. So these would be regulations that that make a very uh, a very complicated process to get permits to harvest the tree, very complicated process to get permits to transport the wood. You know these kinds of in, uh, um, interventions might make sense when you're fighting deforestation. You want to have a handle on where wood's coming from. But when you want to encourage forest restoration, at least for commercial purpose or using markets, you don't want to put a big burden on the landholder. You don't want to make it really costly for them to grow and harvest and, and transport their trees. Um, so even if we, you know, we clear up all those things, uh, there still has to be a source of funding to the landholder, right? There, have to be, there has to be market demand. If not market demand, then there has to be payment coming from somewhere, you know, from a government or a nonprofit organization or a foundation. So you know, the, 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 the money has to come from somewhere. And that's where currently I, I get quite discouraged because of the, the slow progress on um, carbon uh, payments, the, you know, the fact that, um, you know, wood markets are kind of stagnant. And we actually see some environmental groups actively resisting uh, more use of wood. I mean, their concern is that if you use more wood, then that means deforestation. Um, and when, in fact, um, the use of wood raises wood prices and where you've got um, you know, uh, clear um, tenure over land holdings, you get um, an incentive to keep trees on the land and to grow uh, trees. Um, uh, you know, governments um, having big deficits. So the, the financing challenges right now are, are really tough. And, and I, I think the, the right strategy is to learn what we can about what works. And so when um, finance starts flowing, which hopefully it will, we'll be in a better position to say, okay, here's how you do it, right? Here's how you structure a program um, to ensure that the, the funding flows in such a way that you get the kind of outcome that you want. So, let, let, so let's learn from what has been done. Let's do the experimental work to design uh, more um, effective hypothetical programs so we're well positioned when finance becomes available to, to put it to good use. So one of the things that leads to success of these kind of solutions is also political buy-in. Is there a lot of political buy-in or support from governments for restoration efforts? Well, um, I guess one piece of evidence would be the, the NDCs. Um, and I showed a table from this paper for, uh, that the Priya's lead author on, which indicated 
of those countries that have the largest area of low cost forest restoration potential, the top 20, only seven of them had any NDCs. So 13 of them don't. And so that's some indication that you know, a, a lot of countries, although there may, there may be statements about forest restoration are not signaling through their NDCs a, a commitment. Now, you know, that's, those are NDCs for climate change. Maybe governments are, are committed to restoration for reasons beyond climate. Um, I, I would say it's, it's, you know, it, it's variable. Um, I would, I suspect that governments will be more supportive if they see evidence, um, especially evidence from within their own borders, that it is possible to create, um, uh, design and implement interventions that lead to success with respect to um, forest restoration. And there, there again, the importance of the work evaluating what has been done and um, you know, evaluating prospective systems. So that information can be provided to policymakers to, to you know, show them that it is feasible or, you know, or maybe we discover that it's not feasible in some locations, right? I mean, forest restoration just may not be feasible every place. Um, and some countries may be better off not investing a lot of resources in it or you know, investing only in particular locations. So all the more reasons for economists to do more studies on on this. So I think uh, in the thread, I, we are coming to, you know, uh, almost the end of the time we have for for this discussion. Um, so I think I'm just gonna um, take touch upon one more thematic area and then sort of. Uh, um, ask you to offer any concluding remarks you may have, which is to do with, you know, it's a more sort of, I think, normative issue, which is, um, you know, how much of the restoration efforts, what, what, what's the significance of these in, in, in the larger issue of climate change, but also how climate change itself is affecting restoration or efforts. Yeah, it's uh, great questions and, and good ones to, to end on, uh, you know, big picture questions. And also, as I said at the beginning of the talk, climate mitigation um, has over the last decade in particular been a primary driver of the, the interest in forest restoration. Um, you know, are we going to restore our way out of climate change? I don't see any evidence that that's the case. I mean, there, there is a need to uh, mitigate emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, and um, you know, restoration um, on its own is 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 not going to do that. I mean, we can get some shifts from use of fossil fuels to renewable wood as as an energy source, particularly if we combine that with um, carbon capture and and storage. That can play a role, but you know, clearly there has to be a larger role played by solar and and wind and geothermal and tidal energy and and all these other uh, renewables. So there, there's a role for restoration. And, you know, as usual, as economists, we should think about its place. Where is it on the marginal cost curve? Um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, you know, when does it come in? Um, you know, where does it come in? So I, I think there's, there's a, a role for it. Um, you know, we need to know more. The, the cost figures, um, you know, I, I cited a study by Bronson Griscom that was uh, then, you know, showed up in the IPCC report I'm currently doing with work with Bronson and, and others. And, you know, we, we all recognize that cost numbers from even a few years ago are really rough. I mean, we, we don't have great information on what the costs of restoration are, either the opportunity cost of the land or the implementation costs of planting trees or creating conditions for natural regeneration. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. So, you know, uh, a role for restoration, I think so, um, but just how big it is, it's hard to say at the moment, you know, we're still learning. The impacts of climate change on restoration. Um, yeah, you know, we do need to think about that. Climate is changing. Uh, places where trees um, could grow in the past don't grow very well now because they become drier, okay? Places where trees didn't grow in the past, now they might be places where trees can grow because they become wetter, right? So, so things are shifting. Uh, we're losing coastal area around the world um, and you know, coastal forests in those areas. I have colleagues who are working on the loss of coastal forests in North Carolina because of the rise of sea level. I mean, that, that is something that we, you, know, you can see as you drive across the coastal plain right now. So our restoration efforts um, should be aimed at locations where it's likely that trees will persist. 
Um, you know, we're not going to, it doesn't make sense to plant them and have the climate change in such a way that in uh, five to 10 years or 20 years, it's no longer going to longer going to be viable for trees to grow in those places. Um, I cited very early on a study by uh, Jean-Francois Jean -Francois Bastin and others, um, which identified locations where trees can grow. Um, and that study has a map not only where they can grow under current conditions, but also under anticipated climate uh, change. And there's, there's a big difference there, right? Um, so uh, yeah, that's, uh, those are great questions to, to um, end on. And hopefully what I've said about them makes some sense. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, both the, the talk was really, really stimulating, but also the engagement, the questions were very um, interesting and important. And I hope that, you know, this theme that we need to do more work on this issue has resonated with the audience. Um, and, at, and at that note, um, I, I would like all of us to, to thank our speaker. Um, thank you so much, Jeff. Over to Maniji. Thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for you know very uh, interesting talk and very engaged uh, uh, discussion from the, from the audience. Uh, and thank you, Sital, for nicely moderating and bringing on all the issues uh, from the chat to the you know discussion. And um, it is very informative, and I hope it is useful to to the audience. So uh, the next. Um, uh, is like I would like to now invite um, Director General of EC Mode, uh, Dr. Pema Jamso, for his uh, concluding remarks. Pema, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mani. Uh, what can I say, Professor Jeff? I think, uh, you know, in spite of the difficulties, you know, with the technology, I think you have managed to keep us all captivated with your talk. I think you have covered a lot of ground. And I really admire your energy, your depth and width of your knowledge. I think you have covered a lot of, you know, grounds, including answering to those, you know, sometimes quite difficult questions that uh, Professor Shita, uh, you know, clustered together from something like 35 questions. So, you know, I personally learned a lot, you know, and I also feel that, uh, you know, uh, so many people think that afforestation, reforestation, forest restoration is the silver bullet to fix the climate problem, climate change problem, as well as to you know, keep global temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now I got the feeling that this is not the case. It is one of the measures that we need to be, we need to take. So I think uh, you know, very, very informative, very educative. I think, Professor, you started, uh, you know, uh, with giving us a definition of what you mean by reforestation. I think that was also very useful. And also defining what is meant by afforestation and what is meant by, you know, uh, your definition of afforestation and reforestation. I think that those are also very, very useful because sometimes we tend to think that it is one and the same. So today I also got a very clear picture of what you mean by that. And then also what is driving forest restoration? You know, it is like a primarily the interest to reduce you know, carbon emissions and uh, to mitigate the impact uh, on global warming and so on. So you gave us a very you know, clear picture of the global trends in terms of forest increases or decreases, the market prices, you know, all those things and the opportunities for increasing forest covers and you know uh, and the transition from forest to agriculture to back to forest i think those are very interesting but i think the biggest takeaway is the need for more research particularly economic analysis you mentioned the aspects of retrospective analysis and also prospective analysis and uh, i think money would agree with me that sandy scholars sandy future scholars have a lot of research topics uh, that have been generated from the discussions today, you know, including you know aspects of carbon financing, payment for environmental services, the interactions between you know afforestation and water flow, you know, the biodiversity, you know, the uh, impact on non-wood forest products, you know, local precipitation, 
and so many things. I think there are so many areas that we need more research. Uh, and uh, I think most of the studies that have been referred to uh, also originate from areas, from uh, regions other than South Asia. So I think within the South Asia region, we have a lot of work to do. So Mani, I'm sure you have uh, taken note of all of this, but all I can say is that uh, with Professor Jeff Vincent's uh, lecture today, all of us are much richer in our knowledge about forest and uh, ecosystem restoration through afforestation or reforestation. So I would like to end by thanking you very much, Professor Jeff uh, Vincent, for your enlightening lecture and also for uh, thank Professor Shital Sekri for the excellent moderation. Uh, it's not a very easy job. I think you have something, you know, I mean, like 39 questions and you have clapped them very well together. And uh, the responses that we got from Professor uh, Jeff, they're also excellent. And, uh, you know, uh, I would like to assure you that uh, EC Mode is very happy to have Sandy with us, uh, you know, coordinated by money, and that we will continue to be committed to taking the, you know, Sandy work forward, building a very rich pool of environmental and development economies at, uh, within the South Asian region, uh, within the HKH region and also beyond. So thank you very much and we continue to you know, look forward to your guidance and your advice. Thank you and have a nice evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pima, for your uh, encouraging remarks uh, to close this session. So uh, I would like to thank you all um, uh, for, for you know, taking our time for a busy schedule, all the participants uh, for questions, comments, uh, and also like, you know, uh, Jeff and Sheetal for making this event very, very useful. So after this, we will have another segment, but just for the Sandy um, researchers and the uh, advisors. So maybe we'll take, um, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes break. Uh, so it's been more than, you know, one and a half hours. So let's take 10 minutes break. So we'll come back here at uh, after 10 minutes, which is, uh, Seven eight o five in in Kathmandu time, or six, the eight o six. Okay, you th thank you very much. So we'd like to end this this session here, and uh, we'll have another segment because this is the first day of our you know eight day marathon research and, and training workshop that Sandy organizes generally in person. But this is our fourth time because of the pandemic we haven't been able to you know meet in person. But we are just you know, are trying to catch up uh, even like in you know, using the technology and uh, this uh, virtual meetings. And thank you all and see you after 10 minutes. Thank you.